Uh, please welcome Michael Bennett. Morning. Thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning. It's great to see so many faces in the audience. Today we're going to be talking about the progressive framework, the progressive JavaScript framework view. And the first order of business is to just settle the questions. What exactly is or what are JavaScript frameworks and why do we care? What problems do they solve? Based on the crowd, it looks like people probably have a good handle on this, but having been in a recent conversation with a senior developer and the junior developer, I feel like we should probably just dial back and talk about why we have frameworks in the first place. So a few weeks ago, I was out with a colleague of mine uh, who's actually in the crowd tonight, or this morning rather, and he was arguing that we have frameworks to deliver value, value to our users. And that's the stance that I take on frameworks. That's what they serve for me. They are a faster way to get from A to B. Now, our other colleague, he was arguing that we had frameworks for the sake of making more correct code, which is also fair. We want to make correct code. That's right. But not necessarily at the expense of our users. Today, I'd like to be talking about why Vue is so simple and how it can help us deliver value to our users faster and quicker and iterate better and give them the products that they actually want whether we're working on open source code or whether we're working for you know, dollars and cents like some people, the ultimate goal is to deliver value to our users. Vue is a very simple way of delivering value to our users. So we've slided over to some code here and we're actually just going to dive right in. This is more or less the canonical hello world of just pure HTML. Everybody see that okay? All right, perfect can zoom in and out as needed. There's not much to HTML, as we should all know at this point. We can type in hello world. If I flip over to my browser, I was hoping I could squeeze them both in, but that's probably not gonna fly here. So I'm just gonna slowly toggle between them when I need to get back and forth, and I'll give you some fair warning here. So very first, we got hello world. We can refresh this, nothing to it. Now. We could go and we could edit some other things. Like we might want to say, put in a button. Do something. It's a useful button. We can save that. And slowly flip back to our browser. And hit refresh. And there's that do something button. This is basic 101 HTML. Now, of course, this doesn't do anything. This is where our JavaScript comes into play. So if we flip back to the browser, it's not really obvious to, especially non-developers, folks who are maybe exploring this space for the first time. It's not obvious how you would wire these things up. Uh, the, the pattern has changed over time because flash forwarding backwards in time, when the web first was born, what we were actually dealing with were documents. And we're gonna see in the very next code snippet that document rear its head. So let's take a look at something slightly more dynamic. I'm gonna flip over to my little sidebar here and open up a simple vanilla uh, JavaScript program. So we're not into framework territory yet. We've got a very similar layout to below. We've got our full HTML document. We've got a little div here, a division for it's labeled app. It's where we're going to put our stuff. And then we finally have this mysterious source code sitting here in the middle. And what we're doing in this source code is we're saying, hey, let's, let's grab this element by its ID and assuming we get something back and it's working, let's actually, you know, inject some text into it, and pop our hello world out. And again, if we flip back to the browser, switch tabs here and refresh, we can see in our little view here, we've got that's the same source code we were working on. It's running just as it was written, and it pops out our hello world. Nothing to it. Uh, the things that we have to watch out for and the reasons why we're going to start looking at, at frameworks are that we don't really want to be working this way. And it should become more obvious to all of us, if it isn't already, that we shouldn't be doing this. The very first thing here is I've put in this extra if. If we get an element back, let's inject hello world into it. So out of the box, we already have to do some error detection. We already have to look at our code and say, hey, is this actually going to work the way we're going to work? We have to do error checking. And we're starting to get into logic, even though all we're doing is saying hello world. And that's not ideal. So again, going back to frameworks, I like to think of frameworks somewhat like a road. Without a framework or without a road, if you wanted to get to A to B, you've got to walk through fields, you've got to walk through forests. Maybe there's a fallen log in the forest and you've got to crawl over it. 
and then you do it, and you get to the next step, and maybe walking's a bit easier, but then there's another log, and you're crawling over it, and over, and over. And you have to repeat all of that, and it's not great. The framework, or the road, gets you from A to B much, much faster. There's no logs to traverse. You don't have to repeat yourself. Well, we'll see that you do a little bit, but ideally you don't have to repeat yourself, and you get to where you're going. So let's take a look at what a Hello World in view might actually look like. And this is very, very simple, much like the last example we looked at. It's actually slightly larger in terms of code. We've got an extra line or two. But as you'll start to see, even though sometimes our actual straight DOM calls are a little bit quicker, view starts to give us this structure, this road that's going to get us from A to B. View is simple. It removes some of that complexity that's going to get in our way and slow us down. And that complexity is going to slow us and slow our abilities to deliver the value to our users that they need. So in the view world, we have a very similar layout. We've got a division. It's also called app, just like in the last example. Except here we change up a bit. We bring in this, uh, this view.js file. And it doesn't matter what framework you use. Sooner or later, you're going to have to bring in source code. But the amazing thing about view, the simple thing about view, is that here in this just 16 lines of HTML, we're actually able to do a full-fledged app. There's no tooling, there's no build system, there's nothing. It's, it's actually very much like the old days of, say, jQuery or Prototype or some of those libraries that some of you might have worked with about 10 years ago. Or possibly yesterday. I <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay, too. I mean, there's a lot of different uh, solutions out there, a lot of different problems that have to be solved. Not every tool is the right tool for every job. But Vue is a great tool for a lot of different jobs. It makes life simple. And that's one of the things that I like about it. So we bring in our Vue.js. Normally, we might grab this from a CDN, or it might be built in our build system. Typically, we don't actually write software this way. But it's just a nice way of illustrating how simple it is. So we pop in Vue. I've loaded it locally because I wasn't sure about network access today. And then we have another little script down here that says, hey, after Vue's loaded, let's make a new one. So we've got that new view. We're going to bind it to that app element. And you can already see my editor is kind of highlighting things for me. It's a nice piece of modern tooling. It's nice to see it working in HTML and JavaScript. And then we have this data property on this object that we're constructing with view, and we actually seed it with a message. And it's no coincidence that this message actually lines up with the stuff in the mustache braces here, or the curly braces. So if you actually rotate them sideways, they look like mustaches. I don't know if anybody's ever noticed that. They're Common slang in uh, web development. So let's actually see this in action. I'm going to flip back over to that browser. Simple view. Oh, there was a, a little extra on there, and we'll get there in a second. But you can see there's hello world. There's our script. Everything is loaded as is. There's no transpilation. Nothing's going on here. This is very, very simple. Message gets put in, and you see that view gives us back just that division with the hello world in there. So what I'm going to do is flip back to the code and just expand on this slightly. So we've got data. We've got message. What if we wanted to add something else? We could say something like, um, not feeling very creative this morning. I'm sorry. Saturday is usually my day to sleep in. But uh, I'm going to just call this foo. And we'll add a property called foo. And it's going to say something like, good morning, Toronto. Let's actually exclaim that. We'll shout it out, get the let out a little bit today. Good morning, Toronto. I feel like I'm a little bit more awake now. I come back over here, I refresh, and there it is. Plain as day, right in our code, and I haven't had to do anything else. Now, flipping back to the code, if we looked at, say, the simple vanilla JavaScript version again, it would be very, very easy for us to do something like just say, come over here, and then say, good morning, Toronto. And that will work just as well. I can flip, I can write that in there. I can flip back to my browser, refresh it, and we get the exact same output. Or similar output, I've made a typo in the name of the city. <laughs> but aside from that, more or less we're working with what we would expect. Now the downside is, if we flip back to the code, the problem is now we've got two pieces of text that we might want to actually separate. Some of us are coming from development backgrounds where we've been trained to separate our concerns. And this approach here is just not really going to work. Now, if we flip back to the view approach, it's going to change tabs. It's much clearer here that we have two separate pieces of data. For all we know, as like developers, this could be coming from two different API endpoints that we're talking to. 
doesn't really matter what or where it's coming from. The point is that we can actually separate it very easily. And as users, we can sit here, or as developers, we can sit here and read this and say, hey, message, foo, I think I know what's going on. This is pretty simple. And it is, and it's good. So moving along with our examples here, the next thing that makes Vue really simple and powerful is its change detection system. Change detection is not unique to Vue. Every framework has a method or a system for it in some capacity or another. Views is just like the rest of Vue, quite simple, quite elegant, and easy to use. So if we take a look at, I'm gonna just open vanilla JavaScript first. This is a, a bit more of a messy file. There's a lot more going on in this particular example. And I'm gonna to flip to the browser and just show you what it does. What it's really gonna do is it's gonna take one of these edible items in this list, and every two seconds it's randomly gonna change the one that's being displayed. It's a very trivial example. We get that element just like we did before. We have a list of things. In real world, this is obviously not gonna be done in an HTML file, it'll come from an API or something. Um, we set the inner HTML like we did because this is you know, hacky vanilla JavaScript. And we have this set interval business going on down here where it's basically saying just randomly pick an item from this list. So let's see that in action. One more tab. Two more tabs over. There we go. Oop. I went a little bit too big on that. And you can see that it's, it's actually changing here. And this is the script we're running. Doesn't really pretty print nice in this browser, but you can see that that's the native code and things are changing. So this isn't really change detection. I'm actually just overriding the inside of an HTML element. It's actually not what we want to do at all. Um, the reason I did that is because if we were looking at this vanilla JavaScript, and if we wanted to do some sort of change detection, we're actually going to have to write a lot more code. More code than I really want to walk through right now, and more code than will fit on a screen. So let's look at Vue's answer to change detection. And we're kind of setting up a problem here because this is pretty concise, and the Vue business think for this example might look a bit longer. Sometimes that's been the case. No, not too much. Very similar. We have our message. We have our edibles. The main difference is we're bringing in that view JavaScript again. Um, but the thing to notice here is what we're doing differently than the other example is in our interval, instead of wiping out everything that was in that inner HTML, we're actually saying, hey, let's just rewrite this message property on this data object that we've broken out. Let's rewrite the message property and see what happens. And because Vue is relatively clever, if we flip back over to our browser and we look at the Vue version of this, pop down the script tag so you can see there's all the Vue stuff, pretty simple code, it's doing the same thing. And in fact, I've, I guess in my dry run today, I left in this bold bit of text, so I'm gonna just remove that really quickly. Oh no, I didn't, maybe I just didn't refresh. Oh, there it is, good. So we'll, we'll, get, we'll build up to that again in a second. You can see it's changing things here. But the power that I really wanted to talk about is that, and this is again true of other frameworks, it's just views a little bit simpler, is that if we flip back to our code and we add in something at the top, like um, we'll make a strong element and we'll say edible, save it, flip back to the browser very quickly, Suddenly, we have this bold edible text, but our food's actually changing. Our, our edible item is actually rotating, and we're not obliterating that edible. So if we flip back to the code again, we've got edible, we've got message. So we're able to start writing a very declarative HTML. Again, similar to other frameworks. It's just in view. It's very simple. We're able to set all of this up with no build tooling, no fancy like overlays on top of our HTML or JavaScript or anything like that. We just have straight up text, and in 24 lines, we've got a good change detection example, and we're not obliterating this edible bit. To just drive that home, if I flip back to the vanilla JavaScript, and we tried something like that, and I put in, you know, strong edible, and we go back to our browser, and see what's going on. I gotta refresh it, there we go. It never even shows up because right out of the box, our inner HTML code that we wrote just obliterated that. And what that leaves us with is this problem of in vanilla HTML, we've gotta organize all this code. If we wanted to write it, we can, we can go ahead, it's fine, just like walking through the forest or walking across that field, 
but we constantly have to hurdle these fallen trees or you know, traverse rivers, things that bridges were built for, things that roads were built to solve, and Vue solves these problems. So let's, let's take it up to the next example. There's a tool that every modern framework has that everybody's pretty excited about. It's called Components. Vue does components. And the nice part about Vue's components is that, you know, what? Frameworks, popular single page application JavaScript frameworks have been sort of a mainstay for, I guess, eight years now, seven years odd. And in that time, there was a bit of a divergence between frameworks, and then they sort of started to converge back on this component pattern. And what components let us do is essentially write our own custom HTML. And this becomes really, really handy because we can then start to define our views and our applications up here in declarative HTML so other people can read it. Designers who might not want to work with code can actually come in here and just take a building blocks that have been built for them and assemble really interactive apps and then produce value for their users. Again, that's the whole crux of this framework. We want to deliver value to our users and quickly so we can fix it because chances are we're going to give them something they don't want in the first time around. It's just the unfortunate reality of programming. Everybody says they want X, you give them X, and then they really want Y. So the way we combat that is with tools that let us you know, go from X to Y as quickly as possible. So this component business here, we have made our own bold tag. So just like in the last example where we went strong, now we've just come up with our own little bold tag. Again, we're not gonna do this in real life. This is silly, but it's a great little example. So coming down here, we've got a slightly different flow. We're still bringing in that, that view code that's gonna help us out in the background. Over here, we're saying, hey, view, make a component and register it globally in your application. We will call it our own bold, just like this. So that lines up directly. This our own bold lines up exactly with the HTML tag we've made. And then we can put in a template. So we can put in this template here and say, hey, this is just going to be a strong tag, just like in our previous example. The one little piece of magic is this slot business. So view provides a mechanism for projection, and they call it slots. And you can have a much more sophisticated layout than this. I'm sure somebody later in the day is going to get to something fancy in view because there's a lot of deep dives coming up, a lot of great speakers. But this is just the basic canonical example of, of slots or transclusion or projection, whichever sort of vernacular you want to use to describe this thing. We want to put something in the middle of our tags. And so when we use this, this important text actually gets stuffed in down here where the slot is. Let's take a peek at that in action. Flip back over to our browser. Oops. Zoom in a bit and refresh. So there's our important text. It's bold. That's it. Not very much to that, but the concept's really important. These components we want to put into trees because everything we do here is a tree, with the, say the body being the root in this case, or the HTML being the root. We can expand body, we can expand app. We're going down branches of trees. And it's really, really nice for composition. So we're going to be building component trees with Vue, much like we're going to be building component trees with any other framework. Just again, with Vue, we're able to set all of this up in pure JavaScript demo a component without any tooling in 20 lines of code and have it all in one self-contained file. Tried to keep all the HTML in this just to really drive home how simple Vue is. But it gets better. Um, where we can go with Vue next is the second data example. So this, I think we've already kind of danced around this a little bit, but in this example, it's essentially what we've done before, and I just, Highlight it. It's the same example as previously where we're switching between these edibles, except now we have the bold in there. It's our own custom bold tag, and view is correctly updating the view <laughs> without obliterating that edible, which is exactly what we want. So flipping back to the code, not much to it. It's just really, really nice. It gives us these abilities to compose increasingly complicated things. Now, if we were to do this in native JavaScript, we could definitely do this. It just, it would be a little bit more work. We're going to have to hop around those logs. And in the demo that I set up for the native JavaScript version, I just cheated. I mean, it just does the exact same thing. And I think, I don't even think I cheated. If I wanted to cheat, I would have done something like put the strong in here like this and slash strong and then our 
you know, concatenate them or come up with some function or some other system of doing this. I don't want to have to do that. I don't want to build the road. I want to drive the road to where I'm going so I can deliver value to my users. But there's more. The next stop are events. What good is an application if we can't interact with it? So in vanilla JavaScript, we can get at events, like a click, for example, pretty easily. We can say, hey, get us this element. And we can say, hey, maybe set the inner HTML. We're just setting inner HTML for this example so we actually have something to click on, because if we didn't put anything in there, there'd be nothing. And then we can actually bind to a click event and cause some sort of side effect when somebody clicks. In this case, we're just going to pop up a cheesy dialog box. Just somewhat inspired by that earlier conversation I was talking about where the junior dev was uh, talking about program correctness, and it just came out of happenstance that junior dev had never lived through alert-based debugging. You know, we're really spoiled these days. If I flip over to the browser, we've been looking in this wonderful console here. This is a relatively new thing that in the last 10 to 15 years has really transformed the way we've been working in the web space. We didn't have this for a long time. What we used to have to do was take our data and pop it in one of these alerts so we could figure out what's actually going on under the hood. And this is really no way to live, but it does demo that we can, <laughs> it does demo that we can at least, you know, display stuff to the user. And that's all well and good, but there's a lot of problems with this. It's not really necessarily obvious what the problems are, but right out of the box, we have to get a reference to an element, so we have to know where it is, we have to be able to find it. As our app grows, that gets increasingly complicated. We also have to add an event listener to it. As our app grows and as we show things and hide things, this also gets complicated because every time we add one of these event listeners, we actually allocate a tiny piece of memory somewhere in the system. And that's not really a big deal when we're doing it once and we're not hiding the things, but over time, if you're showing and hiding things progressively, it's very easy to accidentally make a memory leak. So frameworks, they give us a handle on how to do this in a cleaner way. So if I open up the view version, as you can immediately see, like in some of the other examples, it's a little bit longer. However, as we scale, this length actually turns into shortness. So what we've done in this case, we've got our app, we've got our message, we've used this magical view syntax here to say, hey, on colon event, so on click, let's call an alert method. And we've added this extra property down here to our view object that's called methods, and we've given it one called alert. That's just calling alert. It's a little bit verbose. We could do this in a few different ways that are a lot shorter, but I wanted to just detach things and, and illustrate probably a more correct way of doing it and having us call methods. Now, some people who have worked in vanilla JavaScript are probably saying, yeah, but you can do that in JavaScript, and you can. Like, we could flip back to our JavaScript. We could say something like um, click, or is it, no, it's on click, sorry. On click equals alert foo. We could do something like that, which is great. I mean, we can put that in line, but then we have to have access to whatever this alert is. So I'm just going to flip to the browser really quickly. And I think, yep, good. I'm still in the vanilla JS one. You can see we've added this on-click alert. If I click on there now, I get the foo, and then I get the hello. The problem with this approach in vanilla JavaScript, if we flip back to the code, it's not inherently obvious, but this alert method that we've called, it's a global that's available everywhere in our browser. If we wanted to start using our custom methods, we would actually have to expose them to the browser if we wanted to use this mechanism. It's a great mechanism, but the problem is we have to get data to it somehow so it knows where to find it. Whereas in the view system, if we click over there, all we really have to do here is say, oh, v.on, click, alert. And alert does not have to be global. Alert's actually stuffed over here in this, um, in this methods collection. And there are even better ways in view of cleaning this up, especially when you get into the component model, which I'm sure there'll be demos of a little bit later. So view solves a lot of problems with click handling and makes our life easier. And just to prove that it works, we'll flip back to the browser. Refresh, and there you see. I can click on it, it says hello. So not much to it. But there's more we have to do with apps. We don't just display text, we don't just process uh, clicks from users, we actually have to collect user input and generally probably stuff it in a database or send it back to a server or do something useful with it. But it turns out Vue is a full batteries included framework and it actually includes um, 
methods for handling forms and input and output. So our vanilla JavaScript example, uh, what we've done is, in this case, I've set up a more elaborate HTML blob. We've got our app, just like before, but now we have this input, and it has its own ID called in, it's got a placeholder, and we've got a slot for our outputs. It's also labeled out. Now in vanilla JS, we would have to say, hey, let's grab this input element, and you know, it might not exist. I didn't bother doing error checking in this case, but it might not be there, and that will throw you for a loop. And we also have to grab the output, and again, also might not be there, but we didn't do error handling, so just to keep this as a terse example. However, in the real world, we wouldn't really want to write vanilla JS that's not checking for these things. And then finally, we add our event listener on change. And whenever our box changes, we're gonna just update the output. So let's see what that actually looks like. Let's slowly flip over to the browser. Blow that up a little bit, and we'll refresh this. So, edit me. All right, let's see if we can spell Toronto correctly this time. I notice I've typed, I'm still typing, and nothing's really changing yet, but if I hit enter, it changes. And that's just because if we look in our source code here, let me scroll down, we're just listening to this change event. But we might want to have something that's a little bit more dynamic. And it turns out there's a lot of ways we could do that in vanilla JavaScript. It's just a lot more work that we would actually have to do. Now in the view example, this is where things really start to heat up and I really, really started to enjoy view. If we look at the view code for this, finally we're in territory where we're actually in close to even range with what we're doing in vanilla JavaScript. We have a relatively simple app division, not too different from the one we just did in the vanilla HTML, except the difference is we were able to say, hey, view, just use this V model binding that you have built into your system, bind to the message property, which again, messages here, on line five here, and also on line 12 here. So we've got, that's all the same message property that we're referencing in three different spots. And here's the really fun part. If I flip back to the browser now, and if I bring up the view, the view version, and we refresh to make sure we've got it all, it says hello world, let's just say Toronto. And you'll notice, I spelled Toronto again wrong, but <laughs> aside from typos, you'll notice that as I type, everything is updating in real time. I can go back, I can go forwards. And that is really, really handy. We haven't, if we look at the source code here, we haven't in our actual JavaScript specified any of that anywhere. There isn't source code saying, hey, listen to a change event. There isn't source code saying, listen to on blur. There isn't any of that stuff. It's just this few lines of new view, here's a message, the rest is all in templates. And that is really, really handy. It means somebody who doesn't know JavaScript can come along come into a source code editor and they could take some HTML and all they have to know is that, hey, there's something in the data called a message and we want to bind to it. That's it. And again, other frameworks give you this power, but to do so in 17 lines of JavaScript without tooling, without downloads, without minification, build systems, this is a wonderful property. So that, in essence, are the basics of why people are loving Vue why it's a great simple framework and why it could be a solution to your problems. So, what's next? That is hopefully answering what are JavaScript frameworks, why we have them, and a little bit about how and what makes Vue so simple. The next thing I'd like to talk about are upgrades. So, everybody has seen a little bit about Vue, You're probably already interested given that you're out here on a Saturday morning, but how do you get Vue into your app? How can you leverage it today? How can you deliver this value to your users? And there's a number of different paths you can do. Some folks, they're gonna go for full-fledged upgrades. They're gonna take their whole existing app and they're gonna say, let's move this all to Vue right now. But let's, let's remember, Vue is a progressive JavaScript framework. We, we don't need to introduce it all in one shot. We flip back to that code really quickly, we can see just how lightweight it is. Sorry, I'll just look in this window instead. We can see just how lightweight it is. There's really not much to it. So it's easy to start adding component by component view to your system. But I don't want to pretend like upgrades are easy because upgrades are never easy. Every application is different. There aren't really clear cut paths to what the upgrade story looks like for anybody. 
And that is always a challenge. Uh, every app needs to be upgraded. They need to stay in shape. Upgrades, as I've gotten the second point here, they're always painful. I mean, even code that's architected really cleanly and really well to be resilient to upgrades can be painful to upgrade. And I experienced that over the course of the week while I upgraded a package that I'm going to demo in a few minutes. Um, and I ran into sort of all the classic problems we run into with modern JavaScript tooling when I did it. The first bit out of the gate is routing is challenging. You've got a router that's probably built into your framework that you're using, and it's probably loading components up from your framework. Maybe you don't have that. If you're using something um, a little bit more traditional, like say your jQueries and your lighter pages, then you can start using Vue in really easily. But if you're doing single page application development, which is sort of my bias, I tend to have been doing a lot of single page application development over the last decade, upgrades, they get challenging. And the problem with these upgrades and the reason they're so challenging is that it's very easy when we're developing to take business logic and slip it inside of the framework code, inside of our view layer. And as developers, we want to make sure that we are always separating these concerns so we can keep our lives simple. So generally speaking, the cleaner the architecture, the easier the upgrade. But again, your mileage is going to vary depending. And I thought that I had an app that had a relatively clean architecture for upgrading. And it, it did in a lot of respects, but it, it still had its challenges. And part of that was because it hadn't been maintained. Part of that was because the dependencies had staled. Part of that was because the JavaScript ecosystem moves very quickly, and the packages, again, dependencies had staled, but that meant the build system had staled, and even getting a build out, it took a while to get that out there. Um, the first thing, though, that I like to see in any sort of upgrade path is a separation, a clean separation of that business logic, because we all have business logic in our apps. If we didn't, we wouldn't really have apps. We'd actually just have demos or show pieces or some sort of Really nothing. The business logic is the thing that's delivering the value to your users. And again, depending on the app of your choice, there's many ways to progressively include Vue. So the app that I decided to upgrade for this particular use case, it happened to be, uh, it's a game. So it's not businessy, but it's a game that's built in the DOM. It's a block dropping game. So if you think like Dr. Mario or Tetris, that kind of thing, I built this about a year and a half ago on an airplane. Just one of those developer things where I was like, oh, it's so simple. And then, you know, it wasn't. I ended up spending a lot of my holiday trying to get it to go. <laughs> but that's what I like to do in my free time. So, you know, to each their own. So let's take a look at what we've got here. If I flip over. All right. So, as you can tell, I obviously work at a UI company because this is the cleanest UI ever. Um, <laughs> But that's not really the point. The point of this program was to see what I could develop on an airplane pretty quickly. And again, it turned into some holiday programming, but that's it. I've got three buttons here, industrial, developer, and view. And they're all three different frameworks. It wrote this application with the business logic very much decoupled from the rest of the program, so much so that you can actually switch between frameworks in real time. All right, I'm going to refresh. I'm going to click Welcome. And I'll just hop right into the view version. So there you can see we have a simple block dropping game, and it's all done in the DOM. And I can actually flip between frameworks here. So if I come back over to this view here where we can see our elements, we can see things like, if I flip to say the developer framework of choice, you see that display has gone to flex, my view is display none, and my industrial framework display is none. I can flip over to the industrial back again, and we can see, hey, look, there's that tree that I was talking about earlier where everything is sort of coming down. And you can see that these are all crazy amounts of text coming down. Um, and again, this isn't really a business program. It's obviously a toy game. But nope. yeah, when I have developer tools open, oh, I can actually do the, the rotations. This kind of works. But <laughs> this, is, uh, this is set up for. I think sort of Dr. Mario rules where you match enough colors and then eventually the lines will disappear. But the point is more that as we flip around in between frameworks, it doesn't really matter what we're using as our view layer since the business logic separated, everything just sort of works, TM. Now, of course, this was not the case in the upgrade at all. There were a lot of challenges. They weren't related to view. They, again, were more related to the build system it's failed. It took me a good hour just to get things building properly. But again, that's kind of a problem we have with modern JavaScript frameworks. We've, we've looked at the apps we've built over the last decade, 
and built out all of this tooling. And then slowly but surely, the tooling is starting to get in the way of us delivering that value to our users. And that's one of the things I like about Vue is that the tooling overhead is very minimal. So that's, that's sort of a tale of what it was like to upgrade. It wasn't too bad, but even though I had architected for success, it was still, I found flaws in my architecture. There were things where I was like, whoa, this is repeated. I, I violated that do not repeat yourself business. And it was really, really unfortunate. But at the same time, grafting Vue on top was pretty painless. There was less code than with the other frameworks, and I got it done pretty quickly. So let's clear that out so I'm not displaying that. And before we segue into the last bit, I'd like to just take a second to talk about uh, Toronto Vue.js meetups. So the company I work for, Wrangle.io, we've been hosting Vue.js meetups. And we've got one coming up on March 15th, and somehow we've actually managed to get Evan Yu, the creator of Vue, he's coming down. So if you're all interested in Vue, you should definitely try and come to the meetup. There's some more details on the next slide here. It's uh, 7.30 to 8 p.m. Evan Yu is coming, and I think the tickets are going fast. I took this screenshot last night, but even then, you could see there were 115 people who had already registered, and I think the cap is somewhere around 150, but don't quote me on that. Go to the meetup site, see if you can still get in. Evan Yu is coming, and he's gonna be a great person to ask questions to. And with that out of the way, I'm gonna wrap up with the case for Vue. So I'd love to use Vue on my next industrial project. Full disclosure, I haven't actually used it on a consumer-facing project, just side projects. But I fell in love with it because it reminded me of why I got into web programming in the first place. I can look at a browser, I can get code, I can make that code run on anybody's device. Everybody here has at least probably two or three devices on their person that can render and run software written in a web browser. And Vue makes that simple. And that's one of the things I like about it. So the first case I have for Vue is onboarding. Onboarding is always a challenge, whether we're talking about folks who are moving from the design space into programming, whether we're looking at like grizzled programmers who've been working on .NET or Java, backends and things like that. All sorts of folks are moving to the web. I can say that from experience. The last two and a half years, I've probably been inside about 30 different companies talking to people about how they can move their developers over to JavaScript or TypeScript in some cases. And onboarding is always a challenge. Even professional developers with a decade of experience, they use their Java or their .NET or their PHP and they say, hey, this looks great, I can do JavaScript. It looks exactly like what I do. And then they come and they do their JavaScript and then they realize that JavaScript is a really weird language. <laughs> and then they have a bad time and they do not go to space today. So. <laughs> The other thing about Vue that makes it really awesome is that you only really need four things to get started. You need a little bit of knowledge about HTML, so maybe basic to intermediate. As we all know, HTML, anybody can figure it out. It's just a markup language. You're tagging things, making them strong, but it can get really complicated, so let's not trivialize it. People would also need a basic to intermediate knowledge of CSS. We don't want to make apps that look like the apps that I make. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I need to do some upgrading on my skill set. And to use you, you're going to need at least a basic to intermediate knowledge of JavaScript. It's really, really easy to get started, but again, JavaScript, as we all know, is a little bit of a strange language, and there's lots of quirks. And finally, the last thing you really need to be successful in to start with Vue is a good text editor in a browser. As you saw today, you can edit in straight HTML, refresh in the browser, and it's really easy. And the great thing is the Vue docs, they really spell that out for you. When I read them the first time, I was like, oh yeah, I'm a developer, I'm gonna you know, do my NPM installs and all this stuff, and then the docs were like, no, just include a script tag. I'm like, what, it's 2017, I'm not, I, and anyway. <laughs> I sucked it up, I did it their way, and I was so happy. I, I couldn't even believe how simple it was. The thing about other frameworks, not to knock them, but they do require all the things that Vue requires, and sometimes more than an intermediate knowledge of JS, but you also need to know package management basics, which for a lot of us might be you know, second nature. However, for a lot of folks coming from other environments, you can spend half a day just getting NPM working. You might need some CLI basics, uh, which is like a command line or scaffolding, because a lot of these frameworks are coming with their own command lines, and Vue does. And then there might be some other information that you need to know too. The other great part about Vue is it's flexible and it has a large, batteries included official ecosystem. It's got a strong core, it has routing, it has state management, which Hassan is gonna be talking about a little later today. It's got template compilation, so you can optimize the app for distribution. 
And it's got this SSR business, which is just server-side rendering, knocking out your app on the server side so you get better SEO and uh, quicker page loads. That all comes basically out of the box with Vue, and it's all officially supported, so you don't have to go find some library that you've never heard of. But again, it's flexible, so you can also just mix and match your solutions. In fact, their initial routing guide is just a roll your own router with HTML5, and it's perfect for a lot of needs. And with all that said, I'd like to thank you all for again for coming out on a Saturday morning to talk about Vue. I think it's a great, simple framework, and I think we should all be considering it for our next projects. All right, thanks a lot.